We're on. You want me to start? Should no, I yeah, should I start. should I do the honors? Will you start? Welcome everyone to Rock Paper Hand Grenades. I am Matt Connerton. Here with me, as always, is the honorable Gary Hopper, New Hampshire State Rep. And a sand grenade, and his uh, tactical flashlight. Um, tactical I, I flashlight. mean business tonight. I got my tactical flashlight. Is that in case you uh, now, as, as a state rep, can you pull people over and, and search their vehicles? Is that why you brought that? Sometimes I do that, but I'm yeah. not. I don't think I'm supposed to. Right, just kind of fun. Yeah, it's just fun. It's a good time. Yeah, you know, it sounds. Like... Say I got my uh, legislative badge. And right, I'm pulling you over to check to see if you're. Ch check, wanna, question like, them if they question, voted for your legislation. Yeah, exactly. Mm. <laughs> good segue, huh? You like yes, that? Yes, yes, that's, that's a good one. Tonight we have uh, Mark Warden from uh, Goofy's Town. He's uh, District 7. He represents Ware and Gothstown. And uh, we're going to talk about a legislation. I want to talk a little bit about, first, was uh, some of my experience over the last weekend. Mm. As, uh, as, a vo as a people watch and know, I voted for uh, 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 Rick Santorum. Yes. And I didn't think he was going to do well. New, New, he's a he's a social conservative, mm -hmm. and that's you know, uh, that's something I try to hide from the voters every two years. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's not helpful. It's you know? a very moderate Republican Party it, in New Hampshire, isn't it? It's it's socially liberal. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, so I didn't I didn't think he was going to uh, do that well. Yeah. But uh, he did okay. I mean, considering he was like uh, two points down on the. I think I like it was around two percent in the uh, uh, a week before the election mm -hmm. to come up to nine percent. That was pretty good, right? And considering the environment in New Hampshire, I think he did okay. Mm -hmm. um, but I was actually bothered this time by the, uh, and I'm not sure. Somebody told me, and and, and uh, Mark probably knows this better than I do. There was a lot of people showing up to uh, Santorum events that claimed to have been part of uh, Ron Paul's campaign. And um, they would get out of the vehicle with uh, Occupy Wall Street people and, and just torment the guy. It wasn't like they were standing aside, protesting, holding signs and saying that they disagree or whatever. That's sure, fine. Sure, sure. But, I mean, they were, like, heckling, yelling, screaming really? at him. Oh, yeah. When, when yeah. They were, they were uh, we went to Jillian's on, uh, uh, I was holding signs out in Jillian's uh, Sunday night. Yeah. I lost track. Sunday night. And and they were, like, trying to keep him from even getting in the building. And they were, like, I mean, screaming at him, calling, um, because he's, you know, uh, uh, votes against uh, or is opposed to um, uh, gay marriage. They were, mm -hmm. you know, calling. I'm not, I'm not going to say what he said. Yeah, yeah. But it was, and he had his wife with him, too. It was so, it was so profoundly disrespectful. And yeah. It, it, I found it very, very irritating. Yeah, because I saw a couple of your po uh, Facebook postings about it, and I yeah. wondered what exactly had transpired. Oh yeah, I mean, it, it was there was a Vermin Supreme. Now Vermin Supreme is pretty, <laughs> he's pretty harmless. He just, he's I just, like him. Yeah, I, I actually do. I had a few <laughs> conversations. Yeah, he just with wants him healthy over. teeth and yeah, and, and right. ponies. I ponies. saw him sprinkle uh, at the. Uh, uh, Joe was there at the, uh, the Democratic, the, the uh, lesser-known candidates forum at St. Anselm College yeah. when he sprinkled uh, fairy dust all over Randall Terry in, yes. in an attempt to turn him gay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he's he's kind of a character, but he's yeah. he's pretty harmless. He's just having fun. Yeah. But um, no, this was this is very aggressive. Um, uh, one of the uh, women that I was uh, hanging out with, holding signs, felt pretty threatened, and I got her to her car, and then I mm -hmm. came back and. See if anybody wow. else need help. It was, it was, huh. it was. I, I think an abuse of the process. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, politics is politics, but you can be polite. Right. You can polite, or you know. But anyway, I don't know. Do you have any uh, notion as to whether those were actually Ron Paul supporters, or are they just? Well, you said earlier something about the Ron Paul campaign. I'm sure they had nothing to do with the Ron Paul campaign. So let's make that clear. Mm -hmm. He would never have his paid staff or even his official volunteers do something like that. If yeah. it were independent actors acting on their own. Uh, but they were no. It could be, they, but it wouldn't be officially from the Ron Paul campaign, and we don't even know that they were his supporters doing that. Yeah, I know that they they had Ron Paul signs, and I know that they were uh, very well organized. Really? They, oh yeah, because uh -huh. they 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 knew exactly where people were going to be and when they were going to be there. It wasn't like, um, you know, I don't know, I don't know. Uh, there there seemed their their main uh, um, objective, at least with Santorum, was uh, fighting against the. Uh, 
the uh, are for gay marriage or fighting against it, calling him a bigot and all this mm -hmm. other stuff. So I don't know what, I don't see why that is even a Ron Paul issue. So I haven't really heard Ron Paul discuss that in particular issue very much. I heard, it, I remember him touching on it in 2008. Right. I remember hearing him addressing it at one debate, and he said something about well. I think he said something at the time to the effect of, I don't know why it's even an issue, because that's a state's issue, not a federal issue. Right. In his view, he said marriage is really up to the church. Mm -hmm. The civil part of it's up to the states. So why are we even talking about it in a presidential debate? Is some, or, or, you know, right. Something like that. I haven't mm -hmm. heard him address that's it lately exactly at all. Right. That's kind of a response he would have to that question. He's yeah. been married himself for over 50 years and has kids and grandkids and great-grandkids. So yeah. he's a big supporter of marriage. But I don't think he wants the federal government involved in people's personal... Uh, Personal relationships. Yeah. yeah. So I don't, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Like I said, I know they had Ron Paul signs, but I know they got out of the same car with people with Occupy Wall Street people. So yeah. Who? What their actual organization was, I don't know. Huh. It was. It was. They were. They were pretty bad, though. They yeah. Were, they kind of perverted the process, as far as I was concerned. Well, were there a lot of them? Like, was it a big oh, yeah, crowd of people? Yeah. Yeah. Was, uh, I don't. I. I'm not good at guessing, but yeah. Thirty or forty of them, anyway. Yeah. Enough at to least disrupt things. It, plenty. Yeah. I know that um, it was actually kind of humorous because I was at, at St. A's on Saturday night. You know, they, they had us in a pen. I felt like, the, you know, it was like one of those old days where they got all the protesters together, then they drive up with a, uh, you know, half track and yeah. pull back the curtains. <laughs> 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 right. <laughs> but anyway, so I, I was inside the pen holding the Santorum signs, and I'm going around picking on everybody else. Yeah. Not picking on, like, yelling at him. Right, Just go right. and start yeah. talking to him and stuff. Yeah. And that was pretty interesting. I had an Occupy Wall Street guy. He's standing there, and I go, and I, and I agree with part of the, the, the incestuous relationship between Wall Street and D.C. Mm -hmm. is, a, is a problem. Yeah. It's a perversion of capitalism, as mm -hmm. far as I'm concerned. Um, and it, so we were agreeing on that. And then I said, well, you know, you got states like New Hampshire, where, you know, you know, Mark and I only make a hundred bucks a year. And he says, "Well, that's not enough. You guys really need to make enough so that you know normal people could actually run for those seats." <laughs> Is that what he said? Really? <laughs> that's he funny. Said, it was wicked funny. I said, "All right, well, you know, there's, there's, there's a certain amount of contradiction in your statements there, you know." But uh, that was pretty good. Yeah. And then uh, let's see, what else did I talk? I talked to Vermin Supreme, and I hope yeah. I kept telling him I hoped he won his nomination <laughs> in New Hampshire because he was on the Democratic ticket. Did he have the boot on his head? Oh yeah, he's yeah. always got the boot yeah. on his head. He's, yeah. he's, good. Good. he's a hot ticket. Yeah. And then uh, um, oh, this is really cool. They at the uh, at Saint A's, they had a whole group of uh, I think they're called. Uh, uh, I'm probably going to say it wrong, but Hasidic Hasidic Jews. Hasidic Jews. Hasidic, yeah. Hasidic yeah. Jews. Acidic is probably the. <laughs> anyway, so, so, <laughs> we just uh, lost a couple of viewers with that. Yeah, just, uh, <laughs> two viewers down, down the tubes. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, they had the acidic Jews, and they and it was strange because I asked the guy where the guy where he was from. So I was trying to get what they were where they were coming from because they got a big sign and they're wearing these big cool looking hats and yeah. you know furry hats and stuff like that, and um, and were these the Jews for Palestine? I saw some photos about that. These guys really? were with ban banners, and they were I didn't mostly actually re real, I didn't actually read the banner because people were walking in front of it, so I couldn't uh -huh. even see it. So, no, I, I, uh. it very well could have said that because they were saying, and it was funny because I said, where are you from? Because his accent, the guy's accent was so brutal, it was very difficult to understand him. Yeah. Like Boston, South Boston? No. <laughs> it was, he was from Canada originally, and now he lives in upstate New York. Hmm. Huh. And he still, you couldn't understand him. Yeah. I guess the com community is that closed that it doesn't uh, it doesn't it doesn't uh, get out in uh, the fresh air very much or something, but um, that's probably not a right. I that's two more viewers down the tube. That's what they I hear that though about the the Hasidic Jews who are originally from Canada and live in upstate New York. It's kind of a, I mean it's kind of a I don't want to perpetuate the stereotype, but that is what I've I've heard. Okay, good. So that's another viewer down the tube. Thanks a lot, buddy. So, so anyway, I asked him about w what the deal was, and he said it's um, in the. I'm going to forget the name of this too. There's the Torah, and then there's the book, basically a book of uh, um, interpretations of the law, and I forget what that book is called. The Mm -hmm. The viewer actually knows the answer to that. If you want to call on that, it would be awesome. Yeah. But anyway, um, yeah, I've forgotten the name of the book. 
He said it in, in 100 uh, A.D. They uh, it was written that the Messiah can't return. Uh, Israel is not supposed to exist until the Messiah returns. So therefore, hmm. they do they want to eliminate any support of Israel. And I said, that's I, interesting. Huh. It is really interesting. It was very, I never heard that before. So I I said, you realize how many. Jewish people would be killed if 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 all support for Israel because most of the you know if you look at the UN resolutions they want to they want to uh, you know get rid of Israel a long mm -hmm. time ago yeah. you know we're one of the the only country I think in the in the world that's <laughs> basically standing in the way yeah and um, he says oh I think it could be done peace peacefully <laughs> <laughs> really <laughs> yeah huh. I says really I says you know you, Palestinians when they after the I think it was the Seven Day War they were accepted into Jordan, okay? And once they were accepted into Jordan, the, um, they tried to take over the country. Uh, yeah. what, I, uh, what was the king of Jordan? Married that uh, pretty young American woman, blonde lady. Oh. You remember who I mean? I know who you mean. I can't but think of But anyway, he, he was riding around in, in a Jeep one day, and all of a sudden he hears gunshots in his own country, and it turned out to be the Palestine, Palestinians were trying to take over the country that accepted them in to yeah. give them a place to live yeah. after they had been displaced. So I says, oh, yeah, yeah, they're gonna, <laughs> it's going to be real peaceful. That's, yeah. that's, that's a wicked good idea. <laughs> but um, anyway, so that, huh. that was interesting. Yeah. But um, what else? So I, anyway, it was a pretty interesting weekend mm. holding up signs and stuff. It was amazing how many reporters uh, I got interviewed by um, about three different European reporters interviewed me for really? yeah I forget what countries huh. like Sweden or something or Denmark and things like that it was pretty cool huh. but anyway I'd like to see your sense of humor s translated into Swedish Swedish see yeah it, you know crosses cultural lines <laughs> yeah that'd be good yeah but um, no I don't yeah. <laughs> I don't I don't know if it does uh, it would uh, translate very well but anyway <laughs> representative. What do you have on the fire for this coming year as far as legislation, or what are your... Well, I'm on the Criminal Justice Committee, Criminal Justice and uh, Public Safety. So we deal with a lot of bills that have to do with... Criminals and justice. A little of both, yeah. <laughs> guns, oh, that's guns, probably yeah, how it got Yes, yes. Yeah, I'm pretty criminal smart. acts, uh, <laughs> guns, knives, prostitution, all the fun stuff, drugs, yeah. Oh, that's why. Oh, okay, yeah, I, get yeah. I guess. You Free samples at some of the hearings. Yeah. Nice. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. That that's even stuff. better than your lasagna. It is. Right? It is. Huh? I mean, you can't afford to buy that stuff on hundred dollars a year, right? So right. You have exactly. To, you have to look for the freebies and the handouts. Yeah. All right. I ain't saying nothing. Okay. So anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll talk to you about beer because I think beer and liberty go hand in hand, and I'm known as one of the pro liberty guys up there, and I. Uh, I sponsored or co-sponsored a couple of bills to do with breaking down the barriers to entry for small brewers. Mm -hmm. Didn't we have a co I thought they had uh, on, on this station they had somebody talk about that about uh, how hard. What, what what is the limitation? What is the difficulty? Uh, it's, it's, there's a couple of different levels like Budweiser, Anheuser Busch, down Merrimack would have a very high threshold. And there are three different tiers of uh, beer manufacturing quantities. You pay slightly different taxes, but in the past to be a let's say a microbrewery, you had to have a kitchen and serve food and this other. So there are some requirements by state law that made it difficult for somebody to enter the business of just brewing uh, craft beers. Yeah. And as you may know, craft beer is a growing business, yep. and uh, it's very popular these days. You look in the grocery stores, you see a lot of these 22-ounce bottles with oh, fancy yeah. labels. A lot of them brewed right here in New Hampshire. So we've put forward a couple of bills. We had a couple that passed last year and working a couple this year to make it easier for small businesses to start up and do this. And basically, so we removed the requirement of having a kitchen and a restaurant. Now, what, what was the, uh, who put in place the requirement that you had to have a kitchen and a restaurant? What, what is the motivation behind that? Well, I couldn't tell you the exact is, is motivation, there a, is but there a, Is there a health, health issue or? No, it goes way back actually to a lot of, to the end of prohibition. A lot of these um, rules that are in place right now yep. are to do with federal rules coming out of prohibition. There's mm -hmm. a three-tiered system. They were worried that way back when that there'd be a monopoly status code because the big beverage manufacturers like Anheuser-Busch and Coors were buying up the convenience stores or buying up the bars and only serving their beer. So 
the government put in place a long time ago, this three-tiered system, so you only have manufacturers, distributors, and retailers, mm. like bars or uh, convenience stores. Right. And there, the three shall intertwine or, or cross over. So we're trying to break that down a little bit and give it a little bit of uh, gray area so a small brewer now can self-distribute or uh, own his own distributorship and, and sell his own beer. And also, if they're a what we call a nano brewery, this is a new chapter in law as of last year. Cal Pratt, who's also in Goffstown with me, is a state representative. He and I have this, this bill to allow nano breweries. They don't have to serve food. And they, so can a sell, they can sell beer right out of their front door. Mm -hmm. They don't have to sell through distributors. They can self-distribute, uh, oh, okay. and they can also sell retail. Oh, interesting. So a nano brewer, is that like it's, a, it's almost like at the atomic level? Yeah, you drink them out of thimbles. Oh, but they're okay. very strong. They're <laughs> I would hope so, yeah. Yeah. More quantity, less quantity. <laughs> and uh, now it has to do with the total number of barrels oh, okay. or cases they sell a year. Now, I was, I was, I like, I, I was in... Um, I was in, in the studio one night when they had a, a guy in town, I believe, that has his own brewery. And he was saying trying to get in, get his beer sold anywhere else is almost impossible mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. of the, uh, um, the big companies basically make sure that his product is pushed into the back, into the corner, into the dark, you know, mm. un underneath, the, uh, underneath the trash barrel to keep, you know, the larger corporations have a, a real are really effective at pushing back any kind of competition. That's exactly right. And if, although, to, according to law, they're separate from the distributors, in reality, the distributors often do what the dis, what the suppliers say. Right, the big guys sure. in the room, the big beer producers, the big beverage manufacturers are going to tell the distributors where to go and w which products to push. So that's why we're trying to break down those barriers a little bit and. Allow beer freedom here in New Hampshire. Beer freedom. Yeah. How how can you? What can you do legislatively to to keep to a lot to make sure that there is uh, truly a a free market as opposed to um, like you said, you know, Budweiser and the different corp comp corporations going mm -hmm. in and telling a store, well, you know, you're not going to get any more Budweiser if you have this on display here. First of all, if you believe in the free market, then we should let businesses contract with other businesses and do whatever they want. And if, you don't, if you're a convenience store and you don't like the fact that Buzz, Budweiser only lets you sell their beer, then you go, to, you go somewhere else. Or if you're a consumer and all the convenience stores are only selling Coors Light or Bud or Sam Adams, then go open your own convenience store or find some investors yeah, and open your own to, and, and only sell craft brews, right? I don't think the government picks winners and losers very well. Uh, no, typically, the government's no, made no, up no, of bureaucrats. No. We want to uh, we want to exploit the free market to get better selection for consumers. Yeah, but I'm not saying that the the government should pick a winner or loser, but it it, it happens uh, also with like Coke and Pepsi. Right. You know, if you wanted to start up a uh, um, a company to sell, you know, birch beer and things like that. It's so difficult to actually get a business started because the the big almost uh, uh, binopolies are are going to force you out of business. It's it's not. In other words, I agree with the free market, but when you have the immorality or the uh, uh, persuasive power of these large corporations, somebody who, who does want to start a small company and get their product out mm -hmm. is is handicapped from the get go. So it's not it's not necessarily a a truly free market because of the, the extortion the large companies use to, to prevent any kind of competition. Sounds like you're arguing for less regulation. I'd have to agree with you there. Because we do not so. we don't have anything close to a free market now. It's a heavily regulated market in all sorts how, of how beverages, whether they're alcoholic or non alcoholic. And I think uh, in today's society with the freedom of information out there and uh, the internet and people are, can move around so well that we don't we don't need all these regulations in place. And I think people can vote with their feet as consumers and go to the stores, the retailers, and, and the suppliers that provide what they're looking for. So you think that the um, what regulation do we have in place that would perpetuate the the, the uh, Pepsi and, and Coke? Forcing its its uh, product into uh, the best locations into a store. You're saying you I'm said not suggesting they are. You were suggesting that one would be taken over and they'd go into a duopoly. And it's effectively what effectively what they have. But still, you can get 
uh, I guess, Grape Mihai and some of these small uh, yeah. local types of beers. I mean, sorry, uh, soft drinks elsewhere. They're very effective, though. They're mass producers. They bring the cost down low. They're great at marketing, and they're great at distribution. So more power to them. Mm. I don't know. I don't think so. I think it's. I think it's. I would. I, if I if I knew more about it, I'd have suggestions. But I don't really know a lot about it. Yeah. But I do know that, you know, I've, I've heard of companies trying to start like, uh, you know, s small bottling and things like that, and they they can't get there get a uh, word in edgewise because the uh, um, you know Pepsi and, and Coke basically have this the, the market sewn up it's, it's almost oh, like sure. a, it's almost like a monopoly which mm -hmm. is um, so are you almost arguing Gary for maybe more regulation to, to, to I don't know to undo I don't know I, like I said I don't know enough about it but I do yeah. know that the the way it, it, it works is not right it's not yeah. to me if you have a truly free market anybody can go to a, a an owner of a store and that store owner could put up a display of this brand new product and this and that and and try to try to push the new product or or whatever and and uh, I don't think they're uh free to actually do that because of the contracts that um Pepsi and Coke Pepsi and Coke make them sign before they can actually get their product on the shelf which most like you say right. it's typically because of the quantity is reasonably inexpensive and um they they need that some basic products to get people into the store, so you, they would be shooting themselves in the foot not to sign the contracts. Right. I know that I, I for instance, uh, um, years ago I think it was over in Peterborough. I walked into Peterborough store, and I think it was Ames before they went bankrupt, and I was walking out of the store, and there was a condom display here, mm -hmm. and candy for the kids right here as you. Jeez, oh, really. Yeah, right yeah. next, right next to the the, uh, the checkout counter, <laughs> and I went to the man and says, "Are you kidding me? You know, obviously, I think they should be able to sell condoms, but right next to the candy." Yeah, that's so, bizarre. And I, I says, "That's ridiculous." Yeah. And I signed a complaint. And stuff says, "Well, we don't have any control over it. The displayers do all that. We we we're huh. not allowed to actually move those around." Really? Yeah. So the idea that these the stores actually it's actually a free market really is is kind of distorted in my eyes you know what I mean because they don't really have they have to sign these contracts for everything and by the time they're done they don't have a lot of say on what they can or can't put on what shelf and where right but anyway that was my two cents <laughs> <laughs> condoms and candy this has been the condoms and candy show yeah the <laughs> no. well, that's, a good idea. Hand that's a good idea for it a is, show yeah. Yeah. yeah condoms candy and hand grenades yeah <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that'd be really good. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's yeah, what I was kid, saying. Kids shouldn't eat candy. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Not good for you. <laughs> well, that's true. But anyway, what else you got going on? <laughs> well, we talk real estate. Real, yeah, go Just ahead and talk about real estate. Something, something a little bit about. other than politics. Although there ought to be a law to change that. <laughs> um, I'm in the real estate business here in the Manchester area, Hillsborough County. And we haven't seen much movement really uh, lately. It always slows down a little bit in the winter, but we're still mm -hmm. seeing depressed prices. It's in a trough. There will be another round of foreclosures coming up, so we expect prices to remain low. But I think uh, uh, within the next year or two, you're going to see interest rates start increasing. We know that just because of inflation is going to hit all the printing that's been going on by the Federal Reserve yep. and the U.S. Treasury, right? It's, it's bound to happen. It's only a question of when, not if. So. I like to encourage uh, my clients to you know, look closely enough. You can buy right. Now's a good time to get in, especially if you can leverage yourself through mm -hmm. financing. Yeah. Lock in at a very low interest rate, 5%, yeah. let's say, and pay that back over 30 years. As the money supply increases and uh, the value of the dollar goes down, you'll be paying back in cheaper dollars mm -hmm. over the years. So is the market bottomed out then, in, in your opinion? I mean, it probably can't get any worse than it's been, right? I, mean, I suppose it could, but I don't. I don't foresee likely. it here in New Hampshire. There are other yeah. places where it'll continue to be bad a lot longer. But yeah. we are in better shape with lower unemployment rate, mm -hmm. uh, and we weren't hit quite as hard as other places like Nevada, Arizona, California, Texas, and Florida. Yeah, yeah. I would, would it, uh, uh, say versus 2006. What are the pri the uh, uh, two hundred thousand dollar house? What's that worth about right now? Let's say the price went down about thirty three percent. So two hundred wow. thousand over from the height down to now. Yeah. Right. Um, so let's two hundred thousand dollars down to one forty. Wow. One fifty. 
Yeah. That's quite a swing. <laughs> so it's it's tough if you have to sell now. Right, yeah. Right? And especially yeah. if you're going to sell now and go rent. If you're selling now and they're going to buy, turn around and buy, well, you're selling low, but you're buying low. Mm -hmm. But obviously for folks who uh, put their life savings into the home or if they were counting that to take out an equity line for other types of expenses like college education for the children, uh, they're upside down. It's a tough time to do it. However, if you're just going to stay, stay in the house for the next 10 years or 20 years anyway, you're fine. Yeah. Is, is there any idea of the uh, what percentage of uh, people are out there that are actually upside down on their loans? There is. I don't know the number. Uh, again, it depends on the market you're in, but it's it's pretty darn high. Yeah. So most people aren't going to go through foreclosure or short sale because they need a place to live. As long as they're employed, they can continue to make the uh, make the monthly mortgage payments. They hate looking at their statement and see that they owe more than the, the house next door just sold for. Right. But these are parts of the normal parts of an active real estate market. And we're always going to have uh, sure. ebbs and flows. People understand that. And to clarify, when you say upside down, that means when they uh, owe more than it's worth? Yeah, exactly. So yeah. Thanks for okay. clarifying. Let's say you bought the home uh, we just mentioned for 200000 You put 10% down. So you have a loan for $180,000. You've paid it down for a few years, so it's still 170. Mm -hmm. But the market value is 150. Okay. We might say you're upside down yeah. in that situation. That's not good. Well, yeah, it's common. So again, as long as just stay put and don't sell and well, hunker funny. down and start to build up your savings. I was talking to one of the uh, the guys that was knowing uh, uh, the um, guy in. Uh, Jerry Little from where, and he was saying that at the New Hampshire Banking Association, or, or I think that's what he was the head of, um, they never got into the subprime loan stuff, mm. and they actually had like almost zero foreclosures. Wow! wow. No kidding. For a long time until yeah. the price of everybody's house started hitting the deck, and then then they started having some. But they were actually doing really good. They actually went to Congress to warn them about the subprime. Mm -hmm. Uh, loan problem, and they just just told them to you know hit the trail. Mm -hmm. You know, people knew about. So in other words, people knew about this a long time before sure. it ever happened. Yeah, but they well, yeah, a lot of libertarians and Ron Paul have been talking about that for years, nearly yeah. a decade now. Yeah, and it's just they Washington was making money, so they didn't care. You know? <laughs> it's horrible. Um, what so about what, you, Gary? What kind of bills are you working with this year? You have any that you're sponsoring? Well, the one that uh, the one that I uh, work on every every two years just died hor a horrible death. <laughs> yeah, I'm curious to hear about this. <laughs> no, every two years, if if you look at what's what's going on in society over the last thirty or forty years, okay, um, and you and you go you go back in you know history, back in the you know the fifties and sixties, the greatest generation was the greatest generation. The people that founded this country, the people that really made a difference in the history of this country, made a difference because they sacrificed mm -hmm. their own or uh, uh, lives or their own liberty or sacrificed their own um, best interest for what for what the right thing to do was. Like in other words, George Washington crossing the Delaware. The soldiers had. Had, had stuff wrapped around their feet. They didn't even have boots, yeah. and it was winter, and they were going over to fight the, uh, the uh, German soldiers, and they sacrificed. It was, it was uh, the people that signed the Declaration of Independence, they all sacrificed. Anybody who signed that document was jeopardizing their life and their livelihood and any wealth that they had accrued by signing that. That's why John Hancock is so big. Mm -hmm. It was basically, you know, you know, up your nose with a rubber hose signature. Yeah. You know. Um, and that's what life is is about. It's it's people that are willing to sacrifice and do the right thing as opposed to what feels good. Mm -hmm. The greatest generation was the uh, generation during World War II that sacrificed, even if they were or not were in the war or not in the war. They still sacrifice. You talk about the people that were back home during World War II that were bringing down pots and pans that they didn't really need for the war effort so they could melt it down and make it into tanks. Right. Um, farmers had special gas that was colored so that they knew they were allocated a certain a little bit more gas than anybody else because they had to, they had, uh, had to keep the farm equipment going. 
But World War II and the greatest just generation was all about sacrifice. It mm -hmm. wasn't about self-indulgence. Right. Um, come the uh, 60s, um, uh, and, and a little side note, during um, the Johnson administration, Johnson wanted to, uh, had uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who was a researcher, I think out of uh, Harvard, um, and it was very well known and very brilliant guy. They asked him to do research to find out what's what's happening in quote unquote the Negro family. And Daniel Patrick Moynihan was a liberal, mm -hmm. so he presumed that the the problem was in some of these inner city communities was that the um, racism and poverty are cause are, are are the obstacle to their pulling out of that. Uh, um, destructive situation. Mm -hmm. And so they took all this information from, um, you know, the uh, census and all, uh, I don't know how much data, but up to that point, and I think since, was one of the most um, extensive bit of research, statistical research that, that, that had been done up to that time, and I think since. Mm -hmm. And um, like I said, they, they had a preconceived notion of what they were going to find out. And what they found out was that the problem in the inner city, the black communities, was that 25% of those kids were brought up in broken homes or uh, non-intact homes, non-traditional yeah. homes. Because children, you know, uh, little boys and little girls look up to mom and dad to grow up. That mom, Mother and father are the greatest in influence on a child's life. Yeah. School isn't, TV isn't, mom and dad are. Right. Okay? That's just a side note. So then uh, the, the me generation came around in the 60s and 70s, and they said it, the, the basic premise was, if I'm happy, that's all that really counts. Mm -hmm. And uh, President Reagan was the uh, first governor to sign into law what's called no-fault divorce. Okay? Yeah. And it's actually at, at uh, I forget when, but at one point in his life, he said it was uh, one of the worst decisions politically he'd ever oh, made really? in his life. Yeah. So 196, around uh, the end of the 1960s, early 70s, no-fault divorce spread across the country almost instantaneously. What, what, what is that exactly? What does no that mean? No-fault no divorce, divorce. Before you had fault-based divorce, you had a, um, uh, if my wife and I wanted to get divorced, there had to be fault grounds. There had to be adultery, abandonment, abuse. There's a whole list of uh, justifications for divorce. Okay. I don't feel like playing house anymore wasn't one of them. Yeah. Um, so they went to this no-fault divorce. The idea was you would re reduce acrimony in, in the divorce proceedings and people could get divorced without ac accusing one another yeah. and things like this. And it was a kind of a, a um, the belief was at the time that the children would be less affected by divorce because there would be less, less hostility. Yeah. Um, it's, and it's like uh, any one of us, anybody who's uh, got any experience in life knows there's often times where you have a theory about how you could accomplish something and then you try it and it doesn't work. Right. Well, no-fault divorce was exactly like that. So it made divorce much easier, Made div Basically, yeah. that's all it accomplished. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the 1960s, you had about a 15% divorce rate. A huge percentage of those... Uh, um, waited until the kids were 18 to get divorced because yeah. they knew it because their responsibility in the 60s your responsibility once you had kids was to your kids mm -hmm. not to yourself right not to whether or not you know your sex life is wonderful or you're you know you feel good about yourself or you're you know and this and that it was it was your responsibility once you had children was to those children mm -hmm. and that yeah. trumped everything else yeah um, so then they came up with no-fault divorce with this new theory about how kids would be better off. In the 19, uh, the result of no-fault divorce was that the teen suicide rate up went up by 10 times. Wow. Um, children of uh, divorce are, more, are far more likely to end up in poverty. Yeah. Um, the idea that uh, women would be st uh, safer because they'd be able to get out of a bad relationship turned out to be entirely wrong. Mm -hmm. Women that, are, women that uh, stay in an intact marriage are up f uh, far more safer 
uh, there's less abuse and everything else than a woman who gets divorced and remarries and or a woman who is, uh, never gets married to begin with or yeah. is single. Uh, the children, uh, likewise, are far more prone towards sexual abuse and other kinds of abuse. There was a, a study came out of Maine that um, uh, said that, and I, and I don't recall the number, don't, don't quote me on the number, but something like 10% of the children in Maine were sexually abused by their father. Wow. Okay? I, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know that that's the correct number. I'm just yeah. giving you an instance because okay. I don't recall exactly. Yeah. So uh, Representative uh, David Bickford, who was on Child and Family Committee, followed up on that because that, that sounded outrageous. Yeah, yeah. And so it turned out that he, uh, they were including stepfathers and, and stuff oh, like okay. that. Right. Because uh, another example of the, the same situation is in England where they profile because it makes sense. <laughs> They, um, if, they, they, if they have a child that's been sexually abused and murdered, they don't look for the fa at the father at all. They go look at the, uh, you know, Uncle Bob and the, mm -hmm. the different uh, people that are surrounding that child who might have had access to the kid. The father is off the table. Yeah. If, it's, if the kid's murdered, it's different. Right, right. But if there's sex involved, it, so a child, uh, especially, you know, young children that are... Um, brought up by their biological parents are far in a far safer condition um, than children that are uh, brought up in um, remarried homes or live in boyfriends and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And because we so, so reduced the uh, threshold for or the lowered the bar of what marriage meant, mm -hmm. there were a lot of people who didn't even bother getting married anymore because right. it doesn't, doesn't mean anything. There's right. no protection. Women were no longer protected by that, that uh, contract and because it, it was so easy to get out of it yeah. that they just didn't bother. And you went from, I think, in the 1960s, and I, this is an exact number, but it's pretty damn close, um, you had a 6% of the children were born out of wedlock to right now, it's 36% were born out of wedlock. Wow, really? 36% of the kids born today are born out of wedlock. I had no idea that number was that high. Wow. Um, and there are other reasons for that, obviously, not just the deterioration of the marriage institution, but also problems caused by government and their welfare system. Yeah, I was right? going to get into that. Yeah. So I'll, I'll go into that right now. So anyway, you had the black community that had... Um, a 25% of the kids in the mid-60s were in single or broken homes, and they, they determined that that was a problem with the kids getting out of poverty. And if you listen, listen to uh, um, NPR, I think it was a few months ago, they, they were talking about the difficulty black kids had getting out of poverty out of, say, Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. and they claimed on national uh, propaganda radio, as I call it, that the problem was that, uh, again, they go back to the original prem uh, presumption that, let's say, Daniel Patrick Moynihan had, had back in the 60s that it's because of poverty and racism. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a huge problem with that premise. Is first of all, and if you look at Washington, D.C., more kids are brought up um, uh, uh, in Washington, D.C., they spend more money per pupil for school than almost any place else in the country. Okay? Hmm. The mm -hmm. second thing is, if it was really the case that it was um, um, racism and poverty, the number of black young people going to college, male or female, should be identical. Right? Mm -hmm. Using their, their logic. Well, it isn't. There's twice as many young black girls going to college as young men. Yeah. That's because most of the girls have a biological role model in the home, uh, and most of the boys do not. That makes sense. Yeah. Because 75% of those are brought up in broken or, or um, uh, you know, broken homes or, or mm -hmm. single-parent homes. Yeah. And that's really where the problem is. Yeah. And like Mark said, there was uh, the uh, war on poverty because instead of looking at that issue they had they, they identified back in the 60s and dealing with it they decided to throw money at it, taxpayer money at it mm -hmm. and you ended up with a, a situation of enabling and the black community was actually hurt worse 
I mean, if, if you wanted to come up with a system by which to destroy the black community in the United States, they effectively did it because that, that's, that's what they did. Mm -hmm. if you, uh, and there's also people who, you know, um, in, up in the state house who are pro-life and pro-choice. And children, uh, children that are brought up in uh, broken homes or, or single parent homes are the ones who are also most likely to be more promiscuous and end up ending, getting uh, abortions. Right. So it's a, it's, it's a, a huge effect of uh, you know allowing divorce so easily to what it happens to communities. For instance, in the uh, uh, Department of Child Youth Services in New Hampshire, over 90% of the kids are from single or broken homes. Really? No kidding. Yeah, and and wow. if you look at the prisons, there was a uh, a lady. Um, uh, I'm not a lady. I'm sorry. A group that was trying to help uh, inmates in prison. So they had this this new program. It was actually pretty cool. And they gave uh, Mother's Day cards to the inmates so they could, you know, send letters to their mother. Oh. And it, they ran out of Mother's Day cards. It was so so effective. So they, yeah. they did that on Father's Day. They didn't uh, need any. No kidding. No, they didn't have fathers. Yeah. The kids in prison don't have fathers. That makes That's sense. That's why they're yeah. in prison. Yeah, that makes um, sense. You know, it's just, it's just a profound amount of... Uh, um, destruction to society. And the reason I got into it was actually kind of weird. It was basically on the, uh, for the Second Amendment. Because I didn't get how you could go from a uh, time when I went to high school where you could bring your gun on the, on the bus to school to a time where a kid can't draw a picture of a gun in right, school. Right, right. And, and that's how I got involved in this issue. And then I started to understand as society breaks down, as if you start breaking down the barriers of society, mm -hmm. government starts growing exponentially to compensate for it. And actually, that was uh, something Jimmy Carter said. Really? You know, for those Republicans who want smaller, leaner government, be aware that as government breaks down, you know, uh, as families break down, the government is, is going to necessarily be there with programs to try to pick these people back up. Right. And I think that's the, the big difference between a, a conservative Republican like uh, um, Rick Santorum and somebody like a liberal like Hillary Clinton. They both identify the, the situation. Yeah. Hillary Clinton in It Takes a Village clearly said that the uh, um, nuclear family is the ideal situation. And she identified all these increases in suicide and all the things I just talked about. Mm -hmm. But her solution is big government. Mm -hmm. um, my, my solution was that the, um, and it wasn't my solution, that was, um, and I forget his name, I think he was the education, not czar, whatever it was, under Bush Sr. I forgot his name. Yeah. Uh, Bill Bennett? Bill Bennett, oh, William yeah. Bennett. Yep. William Bennett, uh, The Broken Hearth, in that he was the one who, uh, the first time I heard of it, was the uh, um, recommendation of eliminating no-fault divorce for couples with minor children. Huh. And that's the bill I introduce every two years that right. it goes to the uh, Child and Family Committee. This year, uh, uh, the Speaker of the House went up and testified for it. Too. Oh, really? Yeah. And it still died hor a horrible, tedious death on the House floor again. Hmm. But I'm gonna k I keep fighting, you know. Yeah. How, that's how the system works. But that's that's my big big thing. The other thing, oh, the other one uh, Mark might agree with. <laughs> so are you saying that Mark didn't agree with? I uh, don't think so, no. Uh, but he can answer that. <laughs> I, I, haven't, I haven't looked at the roll call. Did you? No. No, I didn't. I didn't know that. I, I, I want government out of our personal relationships and out of our lives and out of our kitchens and bedrooms and wallets and our businesses. So I don't think that adding more government regulation in something as personal and intimate a matter as uh, marriage and a loving relationship between two people is a good idea. Um, Even though you can see, in effect, something that worked and then something now that is dysfunctional, in other words, like... But there are a lot of other things in play, cultural matters, cultural changes and trends that have uh, not necessarily anything to do with government. By your saving states, let me ask you this, would you suggest uh, that the government make it illegal to get married unless you have passed a test or taken a course? On um, no. I did try to 
Um, I think after that failed, my first bill failed because it, it fails every two years. There's a few things I tried. I tried to introduce legislation that I think the uh, I, I th it reduced the cost of a marriage license if somebody went through uh, um, premarital training or hmm. or, or thing hmm. like that. That failed. <laughs> then I introduced legislation to require. Um, people go through a child impact seminar before they could apply for a divorce. That failed. The, huh. uh, the, the Child and Family Committee is very, very liberal. Is it? Getting, oh, sure. Oh, sure. they're wicked. They're, they're should be drawn in court. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> but it can get, they're, they're all about coming up with programs to try to, co to deal with the aftermath but they don't seem to have any solutions as to how to prevent it from happening to begin with. Yeah. And Gary, you and I agree that the nuclear family is the best situation for children. I don't think anybody doubts that. And we probably only differ on the solutions, and I'd like less government yeah. involved. But it would be nice if the uh, nonprofit organizations, if um, religious organizations, community groups would start to step up and do a little bit more of this to try to keep families together or try to keep the uh, single parent children yeah. from, from well, going astray. And I, I don't think the heavy hand of government that's paid for by taxpayers right. is actually the best and most effective way to do that. I tried doing that too. Yeah. <laughs> I went to, uh, um, because I voted against right to work, I actually got an audience with uh, His Highness the Governor. And I, and, and I vote against right to work every year anyway, but this time I got a, you know, because of the uh, override and all that stuff, I get more attention than normal. Mm. And I had a chance to talk to him, and this, that's what I talked to him about. Mm -hmm. yeah. I said, you know, y you've got this bully pul pulpit. You could do a commercial. You could do a commercial talking about the, the um, emotional trauma caused to little kids when their parents right. get divorced yeah. and stuff like that, and then have somebody like Speaker O'Brien come into the room a after your kind of done your spiel talking about the financial costs, kind of play into the, the stereotypical Democrat-Republican thing and, and right. both agree to do, you know, right. that it's important for people to stay together, do like public right. announcements, but yeah. that didn't go anywhere either. So I keep pushing the, yeah. pushing the issue because I realize how, it, it's a, it, to me it's a threat to our liberty. Yeah. Because government, your liberty is threatened when government has all the power and it keeps getting bigger and bigger and this is one of the reasons it gets bigger and bigger is the breakdown of the family. Right. So it sounds like, Mark, you, you don't disagree with the, the, the premise of what Gary's identifying as the problem. You just don't think that, you, you don't want the government to be involved in the, directly in the solution. Exactly. Uh, okay. In fact, you mentioned something earlier. You said there's a marriage license. I, I just find that sort of offensive on its face that the government thinks you should get a license to marry somebody you love and spend the rest of your life, your, rest of your life with them. That's just ridiculous. I think there's, there are personal matters between two people and their faith, perhaps, and their family and each other, and they don't need to ask permission from Washington or Concord or anywhere else. Yeah. No, I, th I think they should ask permission from me personally. Call Gary Hopper. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Numbers on the screen. <laughs> Numbers on the screen. Uh, so anyway, uh, what else do I got? That was my big one that failed. Um, but last year I did get that one to uh, get rid of, uh, uh, what is it? Affirmative Action, New Hampshire. Yeah. Oh, sure. That's that's was, that was awesome. Mm -hmm. And that I'm sure Mark did agree with. Absolutely. Absolutely. What else do I get? Um, coming up, I got a, a bill to... In, if, if, if Mark is aware of one of the biggest problems we have in, in, in New Hampshire is the judiciary is kind of can't govern itself effectively. Mm -hmm. And so I introduced legislation. Mark, uh, Paul Mursky, a state rep who, uh, is, you know, really awesome guy, uh, introduced, I think it was 2002, to create an independent judiciary conduct committee. Okay. The US That's outside of the judiciary. Outside, uh, okay. outside the judicial of the branch. Right. right. Okay. So that and it's not the fox guarding the hen house. Correct. Right? Yeah. In which case, the judiciary says, we don't care. Really? Yeah. Yeah. They, well. they say, yeah see you later. Whatever. Yeah. You can do what you want. We're not going to pay any attention to it. <laughs> <laughs> so this year, I've introduced legislation to um, basically recreate his bill 
but as a constitutional amendment. Oh. Wow. And then let them come up with some reason why that's unconstitutional. <laughs> we, we, might, <laughs> we might remind the viewers the difference between just passing a law and trying to get a constitutional amendment passed. There are much different thresholds. Mm -hmm. yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Wait, remind them. Okay, for <laughs> simple civics, civics lessons 101, to pass a bill or to, to change the statute uh, or the New Hampshire laws, get it passed through the House, get it passed through the Senate, tweak it in between, then it goes to the governor's desk, he signs it. As long as he doesn't veto it, it becomes law. <coughs> That's how you change the law. And that can be done in a fairly short period of time. Mm -hmm. Our sessions last six months, January through June each year, and a bill can become law in that short period of time. However, a constitutional amendment has a much higher threshold of coming into be, as it should be, right? That's the law of the land, right. the ultimate law of the land. We don't want to make it easy to change that. Those right. are the guiding principles of government, and they're there to protect the rights more than anything. So it has to pass both the House <coughs> and Senate. It starts out as a bill, just like a law, but it, yeah. it's identified as a constitutional amendment. It has to pass the House and the Senate and get the governor's blessing. Yep. But then it goes to the voters at the next general election. Well, I don't think it goes to the governor. Uh, th you may be right. So oh, really? the House, oh. I, think that, I think that's right, Gary. I'm not sure. Oh. Uh, the House and Senate. But then it goes to the voters in the next general election. And I don't know if it's a simple majority or a higher threshold, like two-thirds. But Three-fifths or something? Something weird. I don't so know. Really? It's, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, at least you have to get a, um, the voters to have a say in it. And it, it doesn't happen very often. I think we have 83, 84 constitutional amendments right now over the last 200 and some years. So. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to get a constitutional amendment through it. But I'm going to try anyway because it will be fun just to aggravate the judiciary. <laughs> and one, of, one <laughs> right. of the constitutional amendments we're working on this year is in response to the Claremont decision, which went down a number of years ago, where the judiciary, again, the rogue judicial branch, took over and said, okay, here's what you have to do to fund uh, education and direct education in the state of New Hampshire. Yeah. And uh, there's a constitutional amendment running through the legislature right now to take that out of the hands of the, of the judicial branch, put it back in the general court, uh, a.k.a. the legislature. Well, I, I, uh, this is bringing it all back. I can't prove this, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I don't have the evidence to prove this, but I, I, I will, I'll put a dollar on it right now that it's true. You look at the Claremont decision because they're having a hard time educating their own kids in Claremont. Really is what it boiled down to. Okay? I am willing to bet, and I've, I've got some corroborating evidence of that, that the real problem with Claremont wasn't the amount of money they had to educate their kids. It was the um, Claremont is, has a huge percentage of single parent and broken homes. Mm -hmm. And that's why they're having trouble educating their kids. It has actually nothing to do with the money. No, of course not. More money does not equate to better ed educational outcomes. Right. No. Uh, you look at that, private schools, religious schools can offer far better education with far better outcomes for much less than these government schools are that's true. costing right, right now. In Goffstown, the budget works out to about $11,000 per pupil per year. After year, it's for 12 years. Yep. And uh, there are a lot of private schools that can do that. Some of the best in the country will charge you $11,000 or less. So yeah. let's, it's not, the solution is not to throw more, more money at it. It's to give more local control. It's to give a little bit more leeway to the educators to do what they know the best and take some of the bureaucracy out of the business. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think that, yeah. And to increase, increase competition. Let's add some more market mm -hmm. forces by reducing the barriers to entry and allowing uh, Charter schools, private schools, homeschoolers also to let the money follow them through tax credits, vouchers, or whatever, because uh, competition always breeds a better product, leads to a better product at a lower cost. I think that's, that's partially true. The other thing, too, is the, uh, you have to understand if you're going to make it a, a f more of a free market thing, you have to take some of the uh, um, restrictions on the public schools. Some of the restrictions uh, passed down from Washington, D.C. and stuff like that for, Amen. for instance, how much uh, they have to spend on special ed kids is profound. You know what I mean? Just, yeah. you know, one kid can be, you know, twenty or thirty thousand dollars just to take care of one child. And, and, but the private schools aren't bound by that same requirement so they can, it's not necessarily a fair competition. So you and I agree to get government out of the education business a little well, bit more. Yeah. That's a good start. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, um, 
Let's see. Karen Testman's coming on next week. Oh. Okay, good. Hi, Karen. Yes, she's she's wonderful. Mm -hmm. She's another uh, uh, Rick Santorum supporter. Mm -hmm. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Mark. For Gentlemen, coming. I appreciate yeah, the thanks, invitation. Mark. We'll have cake after the show's out. There you Let go. them eat cake. That's right. That's right. <laughs> thanks, Matt. Thank have you. Good, <laughs> good night. Bye, everybody. <laughs>